Here, um, like Rachel said, we'll try to start off giving you a over. First of all, I want to recognize Jim on the front row. He's sitting down, but star stage and screen, or at least screen. Um, I want to go over little things that you know give you a spin or uh, my kind of behind the scenes look at things that have been going on in Washington the last few months, and we'll open things up for questions. Uh, I'll try to go a little bit quick here because I'm going to be a little more forceful about when we have to get out of here than usually are. Uh, first thing you saw a lot about in the paper is the omnibus bill we passed last week. So you understand an omnibus bill would be the equivalent on a state level of a budget. It includes all the spending for the current uh, fiscal year, which goes from last October 1st till next September 30th. It just includes what they call discretionary spending, about 70% of the federal budget is mandatory spending. That's things like Social Security and Medicare and some means tested benefits. That stuff goes along automatically unless Congress changes it. So every year all we have to do is vote on the discretionary part of spending. Usually a little more than half of that discretionary spending is military spending. Um, one thing you'll notice right off the bat that's wrong is that we voted on it near the end of March. Okay, so you have one year and you're almost six months into the year before you vote to fund that year, right on the, right on the face of it, there's something wrong there. The next thing that uh, was kind of put in the paper, this bill was over 2,000 pages, and we didn't get a copy, a copy of that bill until less than 24 hours before we voted on it. It's even more outlandish than that because when I say it's uh, 2,000 pages, it's 2,000 pages of legalese. In other words, it may make references to delete chapter 236.51 parent H, and unless you know what 2.561 sub two parent H is, it doesn't make any sense to you. Uh, so you kind of have to rely on bullet points that your leadership gives you. But of course your leadership is going to give you the points of the bill that they think are the best. And they're not going to tell you the bad parts of the bill. There's also a summary the Democrat party looks out, uh, puts out that you can rely on. Um, the reason I voted against the bill, first of all, in addition to the fact that uh, there's all sorts of policy in the bill and are you should be in a spending bill, uh, is that overall the bill just spent too much money. As you perhaps know, we're about $21, million, $21 trillion in debt in this country. That's about 60, over $60,000 for every man, woman, and child in the country. Given that, you should do what you can to keep, you know, it should be really be desperate things before you have to increase spending anywhere. Uh, this bill, by the time it will be implemented, total spending and what we call discretionary spending for this year together with special bills that we passed for the fund in the southern part of the country is up over 17 percent. Okay, I'm sorry. Everybody here? Yeah. If you can't spirit, don't be afraid to raise your hand because they do have a low voice and some of these people can't hear it. Uh, okay, so obviously it shouldn't be going up by that degree. I'll give you my opinion as to why it went up that amount. I wasn't in the room where they cut the deal. Oh, and I'll digress one other thing about this bill. Um, these appropriation bills do not pass without 60 votes in the Senate. Because there are 51 Republicans and 49 Democrats in the Senate, it means as a practical matter, leadership of both parties has to sign on. Because a given number of Republicans will never vote for, I would argue, anything that's almost perfect. As a practical matter, uh, the Democrat head of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, is there as well. So it's kind of a bill negotiated between Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, Nancy Pelosi, and Chuck Schumer. Of course, it's not always necessarily them. Their surrogates are also very involved. And one thing that I'm not necessarily thrilled about, uh, I think Paul Ryan delegates a lot of the negotiating to a guy named Rodney Fraylin, who's from New Jersey on behalf of the uh, on behalf of the House Republicans. Um, I believe what happened is, well, initially when Donald Trump proposed a budget, he proposed a five and a half percent increase in military spending and a cut of about 6.5% in non-military spending. He wanted to keep discretionary spending even. A given number of Republican House members, um, I believe, were very forceful with Paul Ryan and I think persuaded Republicans in general that they had to increase defense spending by 10.5%, which is higher than I would have gone. I could have gone more than 5.5%, but I think 10.5% is a is a big increase, particularly because we're going to have the new calendar year start up again right away uh, on October 1st, and we can increase the spending again. 
traditionally defense and non-defense is spending you up about equally. Um, and as a result, I think the Democrats were able to persuade the Republicans that it would be only fair that they get a sizable increase in non-military spending as well. So that went up nine and a half percent. So overall, you're looking at about a 10% increase over what a similar bill would have done uh, a year ago. To make matters even worse, like I said, it's six months into the year. So if an agency gets a 10% increase, they really shouldn't need 10%, even if they thought they did 10%, because they only got six months of the year left to spend it. You know, I complained about that, and they put special things in there where you would carry the additional money over the following year. But if you're going to carry it over to the following year, put it in the next year's budget anyway. Uh, but in any event, I thought the spending was ridiculously high. It was kind of embarrassing as a Republican to be part of it. It didn't surprise me because I watched this thing working for it throughout the year. I watched these people demand more and more defense spending. Uh, I was aware of the fact that the, the Republicans were not setting in the public's mind that if we have to go up in defense, it's a necessity and we shouldn't go up otherwise. Um, one of the other things that I think resulted in this thing, which I think is largely a fiasco, um, is that if we did not pass something by last Friday night, the government would be shut down. Now, the reason the government continued to operate for almost the five and a half months until then is we did a variety of continuing resolutions. And usually what happens if the two sides don't reach a deal, we all come in and pass a bill just to keep the spending going at last year's level, which I don't think should be that much of a critical vote or a controversial vote, right? You're just saying, you know, we're going to give the sides another month or six weeks to negotiate. We have a growing number of Republicans in particular and Democrats who don't like to vote for continuing resolutions on principle because we're sure we got done in time. Well, if they weren't going to vote for continuing resolution, it would have meant there was a government shutdown. The perception is that that is a very bad thing and a very embarrassing thing. You don't want to have it happen. I did call the Trump office and ask for a veto of the bill because I think they could have easily cut 2% off military and 2% off non-military. I talked to a lot of the Democrats. They would have been willing to do it. But I think at the end of the day, um, I think they felt bound by their promise to these armed services Republicans to go up to 10%. And I think they didn't even want the black guy of having the government shut down by four or five days. I think what happened is if President Trump would have vetoed it on Friday, we would have had to call back all the congressmen this week. Some of those congressmen are even abroad, so I thought it would be a big mess. And rather than have the government shut down for six or six, for five or six days, they just signed it. Donald Trump said he was going to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. Well, so there we are. And I think it is a damaging thing in the long run. Because when you have a big increase in spending, it's not just for this year. Next year, you begin to negotiate, you negotiate off those higher numbers. And I don't think that's, that's a good thing to have happen. Next thing to talk about a little bit is the tax cuts. I want to give you my opinion of that. Uh, the primary goal of the tax cuts was to improve the economy. We went into these tax cuts with a top marginal rate of 35% in the big corporations. We are competing with jobs, with uh, other companies abroad. We are competing with other countries um, when these big companies decide where they're going to expand, where they're going to contract, that sort of thing. We lowered the top marginal rate from 35 to 21 percent. Donald Trump wanted to make America great again. It's hard to imagine a lot of manufacturing coming back in this country when we're uncompetitive compared to countries in Asia and countries in Europe. Uh, we also felt we had to cut the individual rates for a couple of reasons. For one thing, we did not want pass-through businesses at too much of a competitive disadvantage compared to what we call C-Corps, the big corporations. Uh, secondly, we just felt that a lot of people were demanding that if we were going to have a corporate tax cut, we had to have a cut on uh, personal taxes as well. I think I had somewhat of an impact on where we wound up on personal income tax cuts, in part because in the past I did income taxes many years ago in my prior life, but as a result I looked at a lot of tax returns and could see the way it would affect people. Um, in particular, I waited, for example, on the uh, medical deduction. Uh, a lot of Republicans wanted to get rid of the medical deduction in the name of tax simplification. They'd say, Glenn, we only have a relatively small segment of the population that uses the medical deduction every year. Uh, the reason we have a small segment is the medical deduction is limited to people who have medical expenses over 7.5% 
of their taxable income, and a lot of people don't get over that. Um, I think I know that the people who use medical deductions though, are people who really need it. Usually it's people who maybe don't have a well, they could be in a nursing home, and if you have a nursing home, you know, you could have $100,000, $110,000 uh, in expenses, so you're really in, in hard straits. Nowadays, you have big health insurance premiums, and you have big deductibles. It's not unusual to have people maybe have a ten thousand dollar deductible. They have a crisis happen to them, and the only way to get the cash is to take it out of a, a 401k or an IRA. Well, already you're getting mailed there with uh, uh, um, your huge medical expense. That's a little ridiculous to say, and and your tax expense when you're taking the money out of the IRA. It's a little ridiculous to me to say that you lose your medical deduction as well. There were things on the tax that I thought were a little bit disappointing. I am a big believer in helping manufacturers because what Donald Trump wanted to do is make our manufacturers competitive. And I think we could have targeted manufacturing a little bit more than we did in the bill. I mean, you know, your wealth as a country doesn't come down to having a lot of, a lot of uh, law firms. It does come down to, to making stuff in the country. I think we could have targeted that a little bit more. I was disappointed along with Donald Trump that we didn't take care of carry interest. Carry interest is something whereby hedge fund managers who invest money for the very wealthy, um, they, they get their compensation in a, uh, a percent of the gains that their clients have because their compensation is really to me like their salary or wages. It should be taxed as such. Right now, for whatever historical reasons, it's taxed as capital gains. I do not why, know why you would have these high flyers take taxes at a lower rate than the average guy out there. Um, but nevertheless, I didn't win that one. I don't know why I didn't win that one. There were minor changes in the bill, but the minor changes didn't affect the vast majority of hedge fund managers. Uh, hopefully, I'll get another kick at the cat there. You know, just like everything else, you kind of don't know what's going on in that final rule when they make the final negotiation. Uh, yeah, I think there were apparently a couple powerful members of the Ways and Means Committee who weighed in and felt we had to keep Kerr along, which is just a big mistake. I'm going to be introducing a freestanding bill to try to get rid of the special tax treatment. You speak up. And we'll see what happens. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. Um, next thing to talk about a little bit is the shooting down in, in, uh, in Florida. Um, obviously, there are 435 congressmen. Different people are going to do different things. Uh, I have two bills, one of which I think will pass, and the other which I will give a hope that it will pass. Uh, right now, the federal government sends a lot of money to the local school districts here. Obviously, that money is for a variety of things, but I think we want to allow more. F the public is demanding that we do something for school safety, and I think it would be good if the local school districts had more discretion to use local federal money in the school districts uh, for things related to school safety, perhaps metal detectors, perhaps programs on a state level to help the local school districts with security. The other thing is something that hasn't been publicized enough, but I think part of the problem, at least down here with uh, Nicholas Cruz, the Florida shooter, is they had that that I think a completely misguided policy down there. They felt that when you charged a lot of young people with crimes, that it would hurt their employability later on, and the answer to that was not to charge young people with crimes. So up until that shooting, the, the local officials down there were bragging there was, uh, I think, over a 70% reduction in the amount of charges issued against young people. That didn't mean there was a 70% reduction in crime. You had this Nicholas Cruz guy, they called police for uh, things related to him over 30 times. As I understand, there were things down there that could have been classified as felonies, but uh, on the interest of getting rid of the school to prison pipeline, they didn't charge him with anything. Well, first of all, if they would have charged him with something and convicted him, it would have been illegal for him to grab it, to get the guns. I think it's very difficult to keep guns out of people's hands anyway, but, it would have, but at least hypothetically, he wouldn't have been able to buy the, gun, the guns legally. But secondly, he would have been in the system, and I think being, having more attention brought to him, there uh, was a much less likely chance that he would have shot somebody. As a matter of fact, he might have even wound up in prison or jail if they had charged him with a crime. The frustrating thing, is after they began this policy down in Florida, the um, Obama administration or the Obama Secretary of Education issued guidances to local school districts discouraging them from charging young people with crimes. And first of all, it's none of the federal government's business to get involved in that, but insofar as they did get involved, they gave bad advice. I have a bill out there forbidding future secretaries of education from weighing in 
telling the telling local school districts or local law enforcement not to enforce our criminal laws on our minors. And you know, we wish young people didn't get charged with crimes, and sometimes you can question what local prosecutors do, but obviously uh, what was going on down there was for it was just inexcusable. Now it is to a certain extent uh, a local issue. I don't think people in Ozaki County here are going to elect the district attorney based on promising the church to with crimes. So, uh, but there will always be some districts that apparently think that's the way to go. And one of the things I noticed in Washington, even when we had committee hearings before the shooting, this idea that our, our problem with some segments of society committing too many crimes, um, the problem is that we are charging people with the crimes rather than they're committing the crimes is something too many elected officials are buying into. And there are a variety of reasons, I think, why we have high, high crime rates in a variety of areas. But the problem is not that we are charging the criminals with crimes. That, that's not the problem. Um, other things that are going on, talk a little bit about I'm on the Education and Workforce Committee. Um, and we are trying to get through a big higher education bill there. We do not have it on the floor of the House yet, but we hope to get, on, get it on the floor. I think there are two goals the federal government should have with regard to higher education. The first thing is, insofar as possible, we should direct people into degrees that will lead to jobs, okay? Uh, Wisconsin, I don't know if you know this, Wisconsin has the second highest percentage of our workforce in manufacturing in the country. Did you know that? Not enough people know that, you know. Um, number one is Indiana, Wisconsin's right below that, and you get a drop before you get to Michigan. So when you tour the factories, and I tour a lot of factories in this job, by the way, this area that I represent, the eighth of the state that I represent, has more manufacturing jobs than other congressional districts in the country. Isn't that kind of surprising? If you ask what congressman is, you figure somebody from Houston or Pittsburgh or Chicago or somewhere. It's little old me with the biggest city being Oshkosh. Um, but when you go through the manufacturing facilities, there's a big problem in getting skilled labor for these jobs. Young people are not going into it. The same thing is true if you look at construction trades. We have shortages there. The same thing is true of nurses and uh, medical facilities. And it's uh, unfortunate we have a lot of kids graduating from educational institutions with big student debt, and they don't have the skills necessary to get one of these higher paid jobs. We do have a situation in which we have a lot of situations you could go to a, a trade school and they even pay you to go to school. You could come out and make 60, 70, people make people, 25, 26 year olds making six figure salaries, but they have a hard time filling these slots and we have a lot of people sadly taking out student loans and not, not able to pay off those student loans. One of the things that is in the bill that I am happy with is they are sanctioning educational institutions if too many of the students go there are not able to pay their student loans. I think to a degree that's a failure on the part of the educational institution. You would say it's a failure on the part of the student, but realistically I don't think an 18 or 19 year old is fully adult when they're making decisions. I think for the high amount of tuition that is being paid in these institutions, they have a little bit of a moral obligation to make sure that when the students go through there, they come out with a job. They may be directing them into a degree, which is more likely to lead to a job, or helping them with apprenticeships, uh, internships, that type of thing will lead to a better job. Um, and, and just the huge number of kids with student loan debt, that by itself uh, is, is a scandal. I tried to get something in the bill uh, along with the Democrats that uh, would have allowed you to refinance your student loans. Right now, the federal government does not allow that. You can go to a third party lender to do it, but you can't do it with your original lender. I think that's just a horrible way. The reason the Republicans fought that is because, believe it or not, they felt it would add to the deficit since the federal government makes money on the student loan interest. But given all the money they're throwing around in other places, I, I just think that is a, an untenable position. I was not able to get that in the bill. Um, education and workforce, what else do we have, Rachel? <coughs> Oh, most I talk about these things. Yeah. Okay. Well, we talked about the Florida thing a little bit. Um, oh, the, the next thing that's kind of a disappointment. 
One of the reasons it is difficult things to get through Congress compared to the state legislature is that for almost everything, it requires 60 votes in the U.S. Senate. And we have a 51-49 Republican majority, which I'm means proud. to get nine Democrat votes, you really need Democrat leadership to, uh, to sign off on things. In this two-year cycle we're in right now, we had an unusual situation, which we should have had three shots at passing a bill with 51 votes in the Senate. The first one was left over from 2016, and we passed what they call reconciliation instructions to allow us to pass a bill to repeal Obamacare. It's well known that that bill failed, but that was our first shot. Our next shot in 2017 to pass the 51 votes was the tax plan. That one succeeded. You would think that the Senate would want to do something with 51 votes in 2018, wouldn't you? And as hard as it is to get elected statewide, I had a long conversation with a prominent senator last week. I do not think the Senate wants to do anything with 51 votes in 2018, which means a lot of things you'd like to do would be left on the sideline. They can't do anything under their rules with 51 votes, but they can't take on mandatory spending, they can't take on things related to government debt, and they can't take on taxes. Um, the thing I want them to take on is some sort of welfare reform, uh, be it um, work requirements, be it time limits, be it drug testing, all those things are popular. I feel welfare reform is so important because I think you're dealing with the moral fiber of the country. And if you talk to anybody dealing with a business, we had somebody at the last town hall uh, in which you're dealing in that eight to ten dollar an hour range. They will come, they will tell you about people who either do not want to work at all, people want to work limited hours, people turning down raises, because it digs into these means tested benefits. Um, I think uh, given the nature of all these programs, they also discourage marriage because you have a single parent who marries somebody with a substantial income or even an average income, right away you're no longer in poverty and you lose your benefits. So I think it's something the Senate should be trying to tackle right now. I will see what I can do to apply pressure to them. Donald Trump says he's very disappointed in having to sign this big spending omnibus bill. Maybe Donald Trump will get off the bench and try to apply some public pressure on the Senate as well. But it's certainly something I'll be focusing on when we go back to Washington a week from Monday. Um, that's it. Now we'll open it up for questions and see how many of you can get through. I'll try to go as quick as I can. Our first question is Richard. Oh, one other thing I want to talk about. Oh, yep, yeah, go ahead. Um, I should give myself a, an outline. Uh, <laughs> the, the tariffs that, that um, President Trump is signing on. Uh, I appreciate President Trump trying to do something. Trade is very important for the state of Wisconsin. Our manufor manufacturers export a lot of our goods, and we still have a robust agriculture economy uh, in Wisconsin. I know the corn growers and dairy industry are both dependent on exports. Um, already the corn growers have taken a little bit of a hit because Mexico, to kind of cover their bases, is buying more corn from south of Mexico when they used to get the vast amount of their corn from the United States. So, uh, but on the, on the uh, steel and aluminum things, um, Trump wanted to make exceptions by country. And I've tried to weigh in to say in addition to making exceptions by country, he should make exceptions by type of steel because there are different types of steel. There's some steel American steel makers can make and do well. There are other types of steel either they don't make or the quality they make isn't as good. I'm thinking particularly of canning. There's certainly a lot of canning districts in my, uh, in my district. There are rumors that one of them might even have to close if this thing drags on so long. You've got to remember steel and aluminum are inputs towards other products. And so far as the United States manufacturer has to pay more than manufacturers in other countries it puts us at a competitive disadvantage of the final products. Okay, now we'll go on for the... Richard Beery? Beery? Yes. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, my question is, to be reserved, I, I was going to see what you said first. But, uh, the one thing I have, this is you mentioned the tax bill, and uh, about the deficit and all this. Now that had a built big deficit. And according to everything, I, I haven't had an answer. You can look better for this. But uh, everything that we ever seen, including when Ronald Reagan did the tax cut, we had huge deficits. 
know that, right? Um, I think if you look at the Reagan tax cut, the deficits did go up, but I don't think it was because of the tax cut. And the spending rocketed up. And it did not, we did not have the uh, growth as we're talking about today. So I question whether the unless bill is the problem or your tax cut. Today, this month, they just announced that I put in the graph in the parking lot that the federal government is borrowing the largest amount of money since about 2007. So because of the tax cut, so, um, I, I, I question whether or not this is really economically feasible. Yeah, I don't think it's quite that bad. However, it is embarrassing the degree. We are going to borrow about 21% of our current budget, which is just preposterous. Uh, at the worst, I think, when they did that stimulus back in Bush's final year and spent Obama's first year, they were borrowing up to 40%. But, but getting it getting at 21 or 22 percent is a big step backwards. I think at our best we had it down to borrowing about 12 percent. Now we're bouncing back up to 21 or 22. I think if you look at the Reagan years, we did wind up with an increase in revenues, but Reagan just didn't stop the spending at all. And I think that was the bigger of the problems right there. If you stop and think, there may be some things in that tax code that won't spur growth. Uh, though I think it was aimed at some of the more vulnerable <laughs> segment of society. Uh, but you were not going to get back to the robust 4 or 5% a year growth as you want to have in the United States unless your, your corporate rates were competitive. Elaine Volcom? 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 Is uh, do you stand by their decision to um, stop their investigation? Well, I haven't talked specifically to Nunez about his reasoning there. Um, I think we could do a lot more investigating uh, into things that went on in the last administration. Um, but, uh, right, uh, otherwise, uh, I'll, I'll stand with uh, Representative Nunez. Mary Lewis, Mary LaPasta. Um, okay, I've got a copy of tonight's Okay, um, I know the President um, is in favor of spending up to $30 million for a military parade. Um, and I think that that was approved. Um, I'm all for veterans. My husband was in the service for four years. My brother served in Vietnam. Um, but I feel that it would be a total waste of money. It should go to housing and health care for, for veterans. I'd like to know the first steps. Well, there was a substantial increase for housing in this budget, and the VA got a big increase as well. I mean, when you're looking at a, if you begin to go through, uh, this omnibus bill, it is shocking the increases that went into uh, line after line after line. And a uh, military parade um, is something that a lot of countries have done over time. We'll see if it ever comes to fruition. I'm not sure what the overall expense would be given that you're paying a lot of these people anyway. Um, as far as the last administration was talking about, uh, the huge sums that, of course, Bill Clinton got for giving speeches in Russia seems inappropriate on its face. Uh, but that's in general my opinion there. It is hard to imagine, given the massive increases in, in uh, non-military spending in that budget, that a lot more could have been added to it. So yes, no, are you in favor of the military party? I haven't, I haven't taken a position on it because I haven't dealt with it. And then can I, on, on gun control. Yeah. Um, as, as, well, one, as one of your constituents, um, I, I know that school safety is important. Correct. But I firmly believe in waiting period, three-day waiting period for any gun buyers. I firmly believe in banning assault weapons. I firmly believe in thorough background checks and a few other things. Um, 
and I, I think a lot of things need to fall into place, and that's part of it. What's your well, I think they improve the background checks. Then one you have to remember, we have a Second Amendment in this country. Um, the overall number of murders in the country was falling pretty consistently from 1980 until 2014 or 2015. So we're moving the ball in the right direction. Um, I think for a variety of unfortunate reasons, the police in big cities were a lot less aggressive after 2014 and 2015, and you saw an overall increase in murders largely driven by, at least rumors are, changing the police techniques in places like Milwaukee or Chicago or Baltimore, but otherwise, we have been moving on the right direction on the murder figures in this country for a long period of time. So are you in favor of any of those three that I mentioned? Well, auto um, if by automatic weapons, you mean like machine guns, that's illegal in this country right now. We did upgrade the background check system uh, already uh, in Congress since this happened. I can't remember what your third item was. Uh, three-day waiting period? I don't think we need a three-day waiting period. I mean, I, I cannot think of specific examples where that would have changed anything. I'll point out when we try to prevent people from getting guns, and I realize we have to do what we can to prevent dangerous people from getting guns, but I think if you talk to people in Milwaukee and the police and that sort of thing, the number of felons with guns, it is a really a difficult thing to stop a violent person who's going to commit other crimes from getting a gun. When you talk in Milwaukee, you have uh, straw purchases, right? Criminals getting their girlfriends to buy them guns. And given human nature, I am for doing all we can to prevent dangerous people from getting guns. But given the laws, they are already breaking and finding guns. Well, I vote for more laws. I'm skeptical that more laws will have a big effect. Deb Dasselow? Hello, Congressman. Nice to see you. Thank you for having us. Oh, no, I appreciate Glad it. Glad to be in graph. Um, my question is, if President Trump were to fire Robert Mueller while you're all on recess, what would you and your party members do about it? Haven't talked about it. What would you, what would be your reaction to it? Well, I have to listen to his reasoning. I mean, obviously there are concerns about the investigation in terms of our partisanship under the investigation. And it's, it's uh, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. You no, no, right now, maybe a quote to report the other day. Um, not only the things that I consider most important, but in this series of town halls, the things that people are considered most important. I'm focusing on trying to get the spending under control. I'm focusing on the welfare reform. Um, I'm focusing on trying to get that higher ed bill uh, onto the floor of the house. And those are the issues that I'm focusing on. And everybody specializes on, on given issues. I am not overly focused on the investigation right now. And, you know, we'll see what happens. I don't think it, it's interesting you asked the question because in the series of calls we did, you're the first person who asked that question. I had a reporter ask it the other day. I'm not a reporter. I know, but I mean, I had a reporter, the first not reporter teacher. asked the question. Bob Chernow? Uh, yes. Uh, when Bob, my good friend. That's the benefit of getting drafted again. You are uh, a very strong proponent of right to life. Right. Okay. Many times people who are right to life, people who are of choice, are tremendous confidence. There are journalists in which... Uh, I missed the last sentence. Many times people who believe in life or believe in choice are incompetent. Right. And very little is accomplished by doing that. I would like to see you take a leadership position in doing such things as looking at dramatically improving uh, adoption processes, dramatically improving um, uh, foster care, uh, an area that my foundation has worked on considerably. Looking at things that work like Girls for Girls, uh, that has uh, reduced domestic, uh, reduced uh, unwanted pregnancies among black teenage girls in Milwaukee by 68 percent in five years. Look at what works so that a woman, for example, who has an unwanted pregnancy has a choice, a good choice, of where she wants to have her child done instead of having a choice of abortion. Because what currently is being done isn't working. 
Uh, I'd be happy to talk to you at length later. Um, I know when I was in the state legislature, I touched on the issue of adoptions. I know compared to other states, Wisconsin at least is historically a difficult place to complete an adoption, which is a problem. Um, and I'd be happy to hear what your program is doing because I think if you look at that omnibus um, bill, there's certainly was a lot of money to slashing around for social programs, many of which do, don't work. And it sounds like you have ideas that do work, so I'd be happy to have you talk about it. Don't leave until I talk to you. Nina Sukup. Uh, you talked, you mentioned it earlier, but I'm really concerned about uh, the debt that students have taken on. Uh, right. And it uh, affects my family, and I see my son struggling. Horrible. Uh, what? I don't understand why they, there's no help available to be probably millions of people that are going to be dead for the rest of their life, hoping that they were going to have life like everybody else. Right. I, I, I tried. Uh, voted for something in the education committee as far as refinancing those loans. I know going forward, like I said, I'm trying to have the educational institutions be a little more responsible before they promise the kids that good things are going to happen if they take out these loans. It's one of those things, um, maybe we should give the quote about uh, heroin, but I'll say it about student loans. It's a publicized problem, but it's still underpublicized. I mean, you run into people in their early 30s. I mean, there was a, a couple at one of these town halls a few months back, a young couple in their early 30s, over 100 grand in debt, and neither one had jobs who were all connect, at all connected with their degrees. Um, I can tell you that's why I'm trying to head things in direction, but as far as, uh, as, far as people who have already taken out their student loans, um, that is a big problem. And I'd, I'd like to, afterwards too, I would spread out of here if you can tell me your son's exact situation because I love to collect those anecdotes when I talk about the other congress, talk to the other congressmen in Washington. Margaret Youngblood. I would like to know when the next budget bill will, uh, will come up and what the time interval before the vote might be uh, for not only people in the, in the Congress and, and the Senate to actually read through this monstrosity, this 2,000-page document, but also people who are just ordinary citizens to have the opportunity to Okay. Now, the phrase budget bill is not, is, a, is something other than the appropriation bill, which actually funds the country. Uh, a budget bill is a non-binding bill that historically has passed the House and the Senate in April or May. I have been told by senators they will never pass a budget bill in the Senate this time around, which is ridiculous. Um, however, the next bill funding the government will, to a certain extent, depend, and I hate to pass the buck on how quickly the Senate works. Uh, the House had a negotiating position last time around, and we passed an appropriation bill with our the House position last July. The Senate does not even pass a bill setting up a Senate position. Uh, in part, that is because they have the rules over there requiring 60 senators, but it's obviously frustrating to negotiate with a House that has no negotiating position in print. Um, I will say to any reporters in the room, I wish the national media would do a better job of covering our budget um, so that there are more questions falling down on the congressman during the process. I think it has been many years since we passed a budget or an omnibus bill on a timely basis. So I'll give you my honest answer. I don't like the answer. I think the House of Representatives will pass a negotiating position sometime in July, and I think the Senate will not act until after the election. And I think the next equivalent of an omnibus bill will pass in the lame duck session in December. I'm not the boss, but that's my guess. Carol Von Ott. Uh, I have 
given that the president um, has nominated a woman with the name of <coughs> Gina Haspel to be the next director of the CIA, and she was in charge of the dark, one of those dark places in Thailand where people were tortured horribly. What is your opinion of using waterboarding as an appropriate? You what? I haven't read that yet, so. You have no opinion? I haven't read that yet. I'm not sure what uh, what authority she had over that. Oh, well, I would encourage you to look it up. Okay. The question is what your opinion on waterboarding um, I think if you read about waterboarding, you set it up as being this horrible, horrible, horrible thing. And um, I would I would investigate a little bit more. Be a As a former intelligence doctor, I will tell you not only is it very bad, but they're also very bad. Be Weedner? Okay. I'll trade you those articles, but I trust you if you are. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. B. Wiesner. All right. Now here. Katie Hoffman. Oh, it's here. Uh, someone already touched on my question, but I just want to uh, um, reverb on you, uh, what you said before about we have to get our young people into uh, marketable, have marketable skills. I was a uh, union. Co uh, I was in the. I'm a journeyman boilermaker, journeyman iron worker. I ran jobs all over this state, and the the the, the, the accountability of the people that we were getting into the trades at this point. I mean, some of these kids could barely read and write the directions that they were given. They couldn't read their safety manuals. It, it was. It, I mean, we have had to send these kids who the public schools kicked out, and then we have to give them remedial courses just to bring them up to our level so they wouldn't kill themselves. I mean, something, something with the whole educational system is, is horribly gone wrong. And I don't know what they're teaching them over there, but it sure ain't gonna lead to a job. I mean, you know, you got no choice. Hey, kid, you're gonna kill yourself if, if you don't start wising up. This is no time, you know, the, the trades are no time for, un, you know, there's, there's a, you can only take this uh, learning on the job only so far before someone can, you know, goof up another couple of guys. So the, the education has to be upgraded. I mean, yeah. it, I don't know what, you know. Were you in the union? Yeah. Okay, so you're involved with the... the with the joint there, apprenticeship training? Up there at the corner. Uh, I, our hall is in uh, Brookfield. The I, I mean the training facility up in Kakana. Is that your? No, we were for the, the iron workers. Oh, you yeah, were the iron workers. Okay. And I, I was a, I took on two trades, and then I, I'm a boiler maker who we're kind of being pushed out of business because the coal is no longer a, it's a dirty word. But uh, now our pension is in is in deep doo doo because. It, it's an unfunded liability, and all the boilermakers are sitting on their butts waiting to go to work, and there is no work anymore. So, it, you know, everything is all involved. It's a, it's a big snake. And um, I have talked to the other trades. Like I said, I visited the, the pipe trades facility in Kakana the other day, and uh, it's frustrating. They are able to find good people right now, but they're always out there looking. And like I said, they get paid a lot more than a lot of people who go the traditional college route. And uh, they right now are taking primarily people who employers have hired, and at least they prove they have the soft skills before they move them on, uh, move them on to the apprentice route. But uh, I'll say this, wherever I go, there's frustration with the younger generation. And it's not just in construction, it's other places as well. You got to have some kind of marketable skill before you hit the door. Right, right. Katie Hoffman, that's me, right here. Um, my question actually kind of relates to what this gentleman was talking about, and also something you touched on in the beginning. 
Um, you were talking about one of the bills you introduced. You didn't name it, but I think you were talking about the Student and Teacher Safety Act with the federal right. funds. Right. Um, the summary isn't available yet, but from what I saw in your press release, you're saying that you're asking for more flexibility with existing federal funds to make physical safety improvements to campus facilities, et right. cetera, et cetera. So just to be clear, are you at, are you giving additional funds to schools or are you saying no, you repurpose no the, okay, so yeah, there was a general increase uh, in all funds going to schools in the omnibus bill. I'm I'm involved with my department. I'm an English teacher, high school right. English teacher, and I'm involved with my department's budget. And we can't buy books to teach kids critical thinking and reading skills so that they can read manuals when they go to work. And now we're going to have to choose between buying books which, and classroom supplies or having secure locked doors. Which school district do you work in? In Wapan. Uh, next time I hope to talk to the people and get their view of things. I think the state legislature, and Jim, I can correct me if I'm wrong, I think the last two years were the biggest per pupil increases in spending <coughs> in many years. Now maybe there's not enough money there, but the, the additional amount they added per pupil in 17, 18, and 18, 19 was, it's been a while since there, there's been that big of an increase. So, We'll see how it works out with your budget. Marion Stewart. Marion Stewart. Please speak up. Marion Stewart. She was here. James. Cat. Hart. Hart. Uh, my name is James Cart. Uh, I'm a former instructor for MATC. I taught electricians and Bedford. Uh, so I got some backgrounds in different areas. Uh, right. And in, uh, I'm looking at you know, what the uh, federal government is talking about doing with Social Security and uh, federal funding for that. And uh, it seems like they're going in the direction of making Social Security cuts. And I'm uh, very concerned about that because uh, typically what they do is they, yeah, of course they have to cut out the uh, spending that is not returning any in, ter in terms of investment but people taking advantage of the system. Yes, that has to be done. But at the same time, I get the feeling that the major portion of that is going to be on the backs of the people, the elderly, that really can't afford it. No, I have not heard. First of all, Donald Trump has said that he's not going to be touching Social Security. So uh, I guarantee you that's going to happen for several years yet. Uh, I think insofar as anybody looks at Social Security for so-called cuts, um, I think people look at Social Security disability and some people feel that that program has been abused. If you look at the percentage of people working each who are working despite the fact we have like the lowest unemployment in years, that number is still low. And it's hard not to say that part of the reason that number is low is some of that disability may have been abused. Um, I think on Medicare, in the budget we passed like six weeks ago, they began to charge the very wealthy people uh, with higher Medicare premiums. And you don't like to do that, but again, you're dealing with the wealthier people in society. Uh, Trump has said otherwise he's not going to touch Medicare or Social Security. I think when they begin to touch Social Security, uh, and I can argue there are problems with this philosophically, but I think when they do, they'll be aimed to get the high-income people. They'll be looking at people making, say, two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year retirement, and saying they don't need all of it. That's what most congressmen who want to address the issue bring. That's up. fine. The other issue with that bill is uh, what about prescription drug costs? That's really impacting a lot of people. I'm type two diabetic. I get the donut hole in about July. It cost me five hundred dollars for my insulin prescription. Another five hundred dollars for another uh, diabetes drug I'm taking. It's just ridiculous, and that's only for like a it, month it, and a half supply. It is, and we're going to see what we can do about lessening the cost there. Donald Trump has said he wants to weigh in there, and I was glad to see him do it because a lot of people I think are too worried about what the pharmaceutical industry says. I think part of the problem we have here too is we have an overprescription of medications. 
I mean, with the United States compared to other countries, the amount of prescription drugs is, is considerably higher, and it's hard to argue we're getting a longer life expectancy because of it. Well, it's hard to say I'm not going to take this. Right, right, right. And there's another issue I want to talk to you about, and that's uh, veterans' benefits. I'm a veteran, and uh, normally I wouldn't have to pay any of this if I was qualified for VA health care. Now, normally, the, the promise was made to me when I got drafted way back in 1969, 1970, was that the VA, or the uh, VA would cover my, as a veteran's benefit, cover my health care. And they tell me right now, well, I make too much money. <laughs> well, yeah, I make a lot of money, but that's going right out the other door for drug costs. Uh, we do keep putting more money into veterans' benefits. I mean, recently the VA budget, I'm not sure we did this one, but the last one went up, I believe, 13%, which is a big increase given how broke we are. And I can tell you, when our negotiators put together these omnibus bills, the veterans kind of go to the top. Now, that being said, like I said, we are $20 trillion in debt. But I can't think of any group of citizens who Congress tries to help more in general than veterans. Well, they didn't help me. And, and, and I was exposed to Asian Orange, and I can't get anybody to listen to that story. Well, you can talk to my staff on the way out, and if you feel that they're not treating you well, they can weigh in. I'm sure Alex is still hanging around here, is he? There's Alex. Talk to this guy okay. on the way out. Thank you. The parade money should go again. Unfortunately, yeah. unfortunately, right. unfortunately, we only have time for one more question because we have a hard stop time in this room, but the congressman will yeah. stay around and talk to I'll, I'll be outside, and some people I specifically said I wanted to talk to, so I'll talk to you in the parking lot. Okay. Afterwards. Kathy Brockheimer? Okay. Jim Wilcox? Right here. Congressman. My name is Jim Wilcox. I use the Zablocki PA Center for all my health care. Fabulous health care. I wish everybody in this room could have the health care I get. But there is rumors and talk about privatizing VA. That would be a great disappointment. Where do you stand on that? Well, I haven't heard the rumor having it happen. I am in favor of choice for veterans, particularly veterans who are who are not this close to a facility like Zablocki, and particularly for veterans in facilities that are not that good. Um, so I voted for choice for those people. I have not seen anybody seriously say let's uh, privatize the whole VA. I mean, to be honest, I never thought about it because you're the first person to ask me the question. I've never heard anybody propose that in Congress. Maybe it was out there. I didn't see it. Okay, I, I will grab the people on the way out. Like I said, for whatever reason, Grandpa has been very adamant. Did you catch that? He doesn't know where he's going.